Hello, friends. Welcome to the third week of Advent. Today, we continue the story in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Listen and hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin who was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words, wondering what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with the Lord, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's so much in this story, familiar as it is, that we could dig into today. I want to focus on maybe just three elements. The first is this greeting that the angel brings to Mary. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And Mary is rightly concerned, perplexed in this translation at his words, wondering what kind of greeting this might be. Now, maybe we're desensitized to this because of all the, the church talk that we get saturated in. This is maybe something we say, the Lord be with you. We say this kind of thing all the time. But for an angel to appear to Mary and to say, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. First of all, if I'm Mary, I'm thinking, okay, what's so special about me? Why am I favored? And second, in what sense is the Lord with me? Because at this point, the Lord was understood to live within his temple, in the Holy of Holies. We had not yet experienced Christ walking the earth. That's what was about to happen. But as of yet, there was no context for it. And as of yet, the Holy Spirit did not live in people the way that it did after Pentecost. And so for the angel to come and say, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary is rightly perplexed and maybe a little bit terrified that the God of the universe, the King of the universe, has set his sights on her and is furthermore somehow present right now in this moment. And she is wise enough, smart enough to be perplexed, to be terrified that suddenly God has singled her out for some special purpose. 
And we have some clues as to this purpose even before Mary receives the explanation from the angel. We're told in the beginning that the angel Gabriel is sent to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph. And the virgin's name is Mary. There's a lot of names dropped in this passage. And they're all significant. The name Mary surprisingly means bitterness. It comes from the Hebrew root myrrh. It's the same root where we get the name Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, who was born into slavery in the land of Egypt. It's a name that carries in it a seed of a reminder of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt that the people had endured for generations. And so now even generations later, hundreds of years later, Mary in her name still carries the memory of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. That isn't what I would have expected from Mary, the mother of God. You would expect that her name might mean something more uplifting and uh, joyful. But her name means bitterness. By contrast, the angel tells her that the son that she will bear, she is to name him Jesus. In Hebrew, Yeshua. This is the same name from which we often translate into Joshua. And it means rescue, salvation. Yeshua literally means Yahweh responding to the sound of a cry for help. The name Jesus means rescue, salvation. And so if you're, if you're willing just to look at this creatively for a minute, we can look at the story on the literal level, and we can look at it on the historical level, that in fact these events took place in this way, in this order, and, and it is true in that sense. I'm not calling that into question at all. But what's interesting is if you turn it and look at it figuratively, and I say that to mean not that it didn't actually happen, but if you look at the characters in the story as figures, you hear something emerge. What you hear is, you could tell the story this way. Within the womb of bitterness, Yahweh God miraculously plants the seed of salvation and brings about rescue for his enslaved people. This is the story that's being told right here in Luke chapter 1. But it's not just a story among other stories. This is the story. This is the story that is being told over and over and over through Scripture. It's the story of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt giving birth to the joy of the promised land. It's the story of a mother, Mary, giving birth to the Son of God, Jesus. And it's also the story of the bitterness of the crucifixion and death, giving birth to the joy of the resurrection from the dead. It's the story of what God is doing even now in you and me as he is freeing us from our sin to live in the joy of of resurrection and salvation. This is the story of God playing out right here, being fulfilled today as the angel Gabriel declares to Mary, you will bear a son and he will be called the son of God. You will name him Jesus. This is the story. 
And there are plenty of other names that are given in this story that point us back. Remember the promises of God, even generations ago, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember your ancestor, David. And so what the angel is really saying is that the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be a great nation so that you couldn't even count the descendants. They're like the stars of the sky or the sand on the seashore. And the promise that God made to King David that his ancestor, that his descendant would sit on the throne forever is being fulfilled today as the angel tells Mary of this miraculous thing that is taking place. This is the story of God that is playing out over and over throughout Scripture and beyond where the book ends, into the church, into our lives today. That it's out of bitterness that God brings joy. It's out of slavery that God brings freedom. It's precisely in those things those pieces of our history and our past that are most difficult, not in spite of those things, but right in the middle of those things, that's where God is working. It's in those painful, shameful pieces of our history, our identity, and our memory. That's where God is planting seeds that will one day give birth to rescue and salvation. And so we want to resist. We want to stay as far away from those painful pieces. And and for us, it can be a personal thing, a personal sense of failure or regret or shame, or it can be a national sense of where we have failed. Those dark places in our past, those skeletons in the closet that we do not want to bring out into the light. But it is precisely in those bitter places that God is preparing to give birth to rescue, to salvation, and to new life. And so all that's left for us to do is to say yes to what God is doing. And Mary models this beautifully. The angel declares to her, This isn't just you, but your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. The angel is declaring to Mary, your little world of what is comprehensible, of what you know and understand is about to be blown to bits. God is about to blow your mind and go beyond even what you imagine to be possible. And Mary says, in a sense, sign me up. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. How much courage did that take for Mary to say that to the face of this angel of God that day? Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Sign me up. This is Mary's radical yes to the impossible God, to the God of the impossible. And this is, in essence, what faith is. Faith is a concept that's taken a lot of abuse lately, but At its core, in its essence, this is what faith is. We are surrounded by this wall as human beings. That wall is the limit of what we know to be possible. It is the boundaries of our understanding, our comprehension, our ability to see, to sense, to perceive, to understand, to control. And That is our world as human beings. 
And faith is saying, God, I have no way of knowing what is beyond this wall, but I want you to take me there into whatever lies beyond. It is our weak, finite flesh saying yes to God's infinite creative power and love to do what we consider impossible. Faith is saying yes to the God of the impossible. And friends, that is when Christ comes into our world. That is when the redemptive, resurrecting power of Jesus Christ is realized here on earth. When his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. It's when ordinary people, men and women, children, say yes to the God of the impossible in faith. That is the story of this teenage virgin living long ago who said yes in faith to something impossible. That's the story of Advent here today for us, is when we simply in faith, not being able to see or perceive, to control or manipulate, say yes to the God of the impossible and let him come into our world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.